Okay, so I think let's start. So thanks everybody who still is connected to the very long uh, day. <laughs> Uh, and I'm very happy to have uh, Marcus uh, hanging on in here. Sorry, I was just uh, very happy to have Marcus hanging on in here. So uh, Marcus is a, is a research fellow um, at Aalto University, and he has been working on, on Gaussian processes for a, for a long time now. He's also been looking at uh, ways to combine differential equations and, and Gaussian processes. But today he's going to be talking about spectral kernels, which is a very nice uh, way to end uh, the sort of talks today on GPS kernel and, and then kernels by Nicolas. So thanks again for doing this, Marcus. And uh, yeah, happy to have you here. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for for the invite. It's really really cool to be here. I, I think this talk will really nicely complement the earlier talk on, on kernel design. So I'm, I'm really going deeper into one aspect of kernel design, which is namely the spectral kernels, where you can you don't really have to choose the functional form of your your kernel that you're going to use. You can you can use Fourier theory, and then you can actually uh, learn arbitrary kernel kernel shapes. Okay, so let, let's let's immediately go go the go the business. Okay, so he, here is a few introductory slides. So, so the way I see Gaussian processes is that for me, Gaussian processes at the core are Bayesian non-parametric kernel models. So they are Bayesian because we have a prior of functions and we learn a posterior over functions. They are non-parametric in terms of classic interpretation because there is no parameters as such that represents these functions. Uh, the parameters are actually the data uh, that, that we condition against. And they are kernel models because uh, we, we look at the look at the data through pairwise similarities and, and that sort of induces the whole model. Okay, so so for me the, the main idea of Gaussian processes can be encoded in just a single equation, which is this one big big thing here. So we really are interested in the joint distribution of multiple function values at different locations. And under Gaussian processes, we know that okay, that guy is a Gaussian under some mean function or, or a mean vector coming from mean function and some covariance matrix coming from the kernel function. Now, when we talk about the Gaussian process prior and if we just draw stuff from the prior, then we are simply drawing stuff from a Gaussian where you have mean zero and we have the kernel matrix which just comes directly from the kernel function evaluations. If you are talking about the Gaussian process posterior in the, in the regression case and, and under some assumptions, the, the mean function becomes the, the posterior mean, and the, the uh, sort of the kernel matrix itself comes from the posterior covariance structure, which requires a bit of computing. Okay, and for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to sort of walk towards the kernel kernel selection problem and, and spectral kernels. So first, we need to look at how would we optimize a kernel or learn a kernel under, under Gaussian processes. So the classic approach is to use marginal log likelihoods. So that would mean that we integrate out the function space from the pri function prior PF, and we evaluate them against the, the likelihood PY given F. And again, under regression setting or under sort of suitable assumptions, this then simplifies into this very convenient equation that just has this data fit term and the model complexity term. And now if, if you look at this a bit closer, so what this integral actually does is that it, it tries to measure the volume of functions from the prior that match the data. And this seems like a, quite a sensible thing to, to optimize. So when we optimize against marginal log likelihood, we usually are quite robust against overfitting. So here the robustness comes from, or the regularization comes from the model complexity term where we have a determinant, and determinant by definition measures the volume of space that is spanned by the, the, the kernel matrix. So when we, we maximize the marginal log likelihood, we minimize the model complexity term because it has a minus in front of it. And this means that we try to find a simple basis for the data, sort of simple function prior for the data. Uh, the problem here is that it still can overfit if the PF is very flexible 
and can be sort of shaped to match against the PYF. So usually this is not a problem if we choose like a Gaussian kernel. So then it, it's such a rigid uh, prior family that we cannot really sort of shape it to match, match the likelihood perfectly. So, so they're kind of safe there. But th this point will sort of come, come more evident later when I talk about more complex kernel families. Okay, so, so this is what we, we, what we assume uh, in this talk. So we assume that we have much more likelihood that we just optimize. We can auto differentiate this guy. We can just maximize the theta with respect to the log py theta. And there are many, many good frameworks to, to do this. For example, GP flow and CPy torch. And also like you could also do something like this in Stan as well and in Julia. Okay, let, let's go forward. So then if we now have the mechanism on how to, how to optimize the kernel's hyperparameters, given that we have chosen kernel, how do we then choose the kernel? So this is already what, what you heard about today. So we of course have many different kernels to choose from. For example, the Gaussian kernel is the most, con most common. We have the periodic kernel, we have the linear kernel, we could have composite kernels where we combine multiple kernels together to sort of try to get the best, best properties of multiple kernels. For example, in this figure, we have some, some very classic periodic data where we have uh, CO2 concentrations over time and it kind of fluctuates up and down every year, but the pattern itself sort of keeps, keeps repeating. So here, uh, a periodic kernel is very good at capturing this uh, this uh, periodic trend and it can extrapolate nicely the future. That would be the, the blue guy, but it cannot understand the slope. And then in contrast, the Gaussian kernel is quite good at understanding the slope as well as the linear kernel, but then the Gaussian kernel cannot extrapolate outside the data range simply because it, Gaussian kernel just looks at the nearest neighbor, sort of just neighborhood and interpolates based on the neighborhood. So it, it cannot really understand the structure in the data. It just basically looks at the neighbors and says, okay, let's borrow the neighbor's values more or less. So, so the topic of today, today's talk will be spectral kernels, which sort of make the promise that they can learn arbitrary kernel functional forms, where you don't need to specify the functional form at all, but instead you specify a family of kernels. And actually all of these four kernels here are instances of that one family. And then when we do optimization over that family, we can then learn maybe one of these fours or maybe something that is between these, these kernels or, or some, some sort of very exotic looking kernel. Okay, and since we are talking about spectral kernels that already hints that this is probably has something to do with Fourier's. So let's look at Fourier transform first as, as background. So I'm, I'm going to give a very sort of practical and rather informal uh, presentation of Fourier's. So here I'm, I'm taking sort of the machine learning viewpoint and not, not really defining things rigorously and mathematically. So we have a Fourier transform and we have an inverse Fourier transform. So we're interested in, in, a, in a function f of x, which is our signal. So that is the red guy on the, on the right. Uh, the inverse Fourier transform states that the function f of x can be represented as an infinite integral over uh, the exponential term weighted by spectral density S of uh, omega, where omega are frequencies and S's are the amplitudes of those frequencies, uh, kind of weights of the frequencies. So the main idea is that we have this exponential term, which uh, defines various sinusoids with different frequencies, and then S's are the weights of those sinusoids. Now, inverse Fourier transform says, how do we get the function uh, if we know the spectral density. The Fourier transform says, how do we get the spectral density if we know the function? And they are kind of dual, so we can go back and forth here. So here in this figure, uh, the red guy is the function f of x. Uh, the blue bars are the uh, spectral density, s of uh, omega. And each of those blue wavy lines is a different frequency component represented by the exponent. Uh, here, to, to really sort of concretize the Fourier's, it, it's quite annoying that we have this imaginary number here. And a very practical tool to sort of untangle ourselves from this, this sort of abstractness is to use the Euler's identity, which uh, places an identity on the, on the imaginary exponent, so that it just decomposes it into a cosine and imaginary sine part, which then means that this exponential term with the two pi i x uh, omega, uh, 
becomes a cosine plus an imaginary sine. So already this looks much more sort of concrete and easier to easier to approach. Okay, so this, this has been just the basics of Fourier transforms. Now, we are interested in applying Fourier transforms not on the Gaussian process function itself, the f of x. We are actually interested in applying to the kernel function, the k of x, x prime. Now, the problem is that the kernel function is a function of two parameters, x and x prime. And here we have only talked about Fourier of f of x, which is a, has a single argument. So how do we, how do we apply Fourier to kernels? Well, a very simple approach is that actually any stationary kernel can be represented as a function of the distance between the two inputs instead of kx x prime. So th this applies to all stationary kernels, for example, Gaussian kernel, modern kernel, and, and many others. Okay, so let, let's then do this. So there is, the, there is this nice theorem that derives from Wagner's theorem, which says that any stationary kernel k and its spectral density s are Fourier duals, where we then kind of repeat these previous equations. So we know that the kernel is an infinite integral uh, of these sinusoidal components weighted by the spectral density. And the spectral density is an infinite integral uh, over the sinusoidal terms uh, weighted by the kernel values. So what's sort of the effect of, of this, this theorem? We, we can look at this theorem from two sides. So we can either go from the spectral density to the kernel or the kernel from the kernel to the spectral density. So let's first look at the sort of the less interesting direction. So all kernels have a spectral density. That is kind of what this theorem is saying. So if, if someone gives you a kernel, we can always solve what frequencies does this kernel consider. So that would be the Fourier transform, the second equation. So this might be theoretically interesting for, for some cases. Uh, in, in terms of sort of kernel learning, it, it's not particularly useful or interesting. Uh, for that, the other direction is much, much cooler. So if, if someone gives you a spectral density, then we can solve what is the corresponding kernel. And if someone goes and okay, let's change the spectral density a bit, we can go back and solve the kernel again, and we would get a different kernel back. So this then immediately opens sort of the floodgates that, okay, by optimizing over the spectral density, we can then optimize over the kernel space. And here we would then be using, in this case, the inverse Fourier transform, which is the first equation. Marcus, sorry to interrupt. There, there is a question in the chat. Um, yes, I, I can see it. Can you see? Yeah. Yes, very good. So, so please go ahead and ask questions in the chat if, if you... Uh, if you have any questions. So, so Mohit asks, is tau a vector in Bogner's theorem? Oh uh, yes, tau becomes a vector. Yes, so I'm, I'm here mixing sort of notation a bit. And any other questions? So generally this, this all of this stuff, uh, I, I'm sort of representing in the univariate form, which is just simpler, but uh, these things do generalize into multivariate. Oh, that's not a good question. Okay, so yes, we have a, we have a, Question from Harry. So is there a monotonic map between the two spaces? Um, not completely sure. I would assume yes. Yeah, no, not totally sure about this. Okay, let's go forward. No other questions apparently. Okay, so let's try to try to simplify these, these equations down a bit. Uh, so, so we can now make a bunch of assumptions and sort of like defining base, some basic identities. So first of all, if we assume a symmetric frequency distribution, which means that uh, the frequency, the amplitude of both negative and positive frequency are the same, this is quite a mild assumption. Uh, we can also note that, okay, we have the Euler identity, we have the sine identity, which means that inside the sine, we can take a minus is outside. Now we actually have all the tools to actually solve the inverse Fourier or make it into a much, much simpler form. So here in this uh, huge set of equations, the first line just repeats the inverse Fourier. The second line has applied the Euler's identity, which means that we just place here cosine and sines and the imaginary guy here. The third line is 
separating this uh, imaginary integral into two parts, into the negative uh, portion of the integral and integrating the positive support. So we have here, see here that we just integrate from minus infinity to zero and then from zero to infinity. So nothing really happens here. All of these are identities. Now, if we now look at this guy more closely, we can now reverse this integration domain by adding a minus in front of the, the frequency. So we would just flip the, the integration domain and we would also flip the frequencies. And again, nothing happens. Now we know that we assume that this guy is now symmetric. So this minus goes away. We also assume that we know the sign identity, which means that this minus can be taken outside. So it goes here. So now we can see that we actually have here this whole integral twice, but once as a minus. So the whole thing cancels out. And we simply have that under symmetric frequencies, uh, the kernel becomes a linear combination of cosines. And this now looks much, much more simpler than before as well. And, and we actually know that all stationary kernels can be represented in this form. So this is actually not a limitation when we assume the symmetric frequency distribution. Okay, so um, if there's no questions, I'll, I'll continue. So now, now we can look at uh, what would be the Fourier uh, transformation of a Gaussian kernel or its Fourier representation. So for a Gaussian kernel, which we can in a very simple format uh, write out like this, uh, its spectral density here is known and it's in closed form. So it's simply an another Gaussian, which just has a bunch of different terms inside uh, weighting it. We also now, of course, we know the Gaussian kernel final form, but for this exercise, we can now look at what would be the sort of the mixture of cosine representation of a Gaussian kernel. Can, can we do it? And we could now integrate this integral in a numeric form by just sort of looping through these different frequencies where here in the spectral density, we see the density here in this red. So this would be the S value. We see the frequency as the blue guy, which is the cosine term. On the left, we see the blue uh, cosine terms as the different cosines that we are now considering with different frequencies. The red is the cosine multiplied by the uh, spectral density. And if we now sum all of these together, this dashed blue line on the left should converge to the true Gaussian kernel on the left. And this seems to happen. So we actually can verify this also empirically. There's a quick question um, in uh, the chat. Um, yes, yeah, so Andy asked, is there an intuitive explanation for the kernel Fourier weight symmetry? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it kind of just says that uh, negative frequencies and positive frequencies kind of like, like there's no difference between, so we can just mirror the frequencies. So often when we think of negative frequencies, it sounds a bit strange because like what, what would be the intuitive interpretation of negative frequencies? So by saying that this is a symmetric, you're effectively saying that we only consider the positive frequency range. And that kind of is, is, is a simpler approach uh, to, to kernel learning. Okay. Oh, there's a, what's the question? Sorry, I've lost track. What's the question in the Q&A? So there's two sources of questions, unfortunately. So uh, someone else asked this, is it possible to, a given spectral density leads to a PSD kernel function? Uh, excuse me, can you repeat? Sorry, that? is it possible to determine if a given spectral density leads to a um, PSD kernel function? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's an excellent question. So so the 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 spectral density itself needs to have some some regularity properties for it to generate a positive definite uh, um, uh, function or a kernel. And also the Fourier itself. I mean, uh, I I do believe that you can apply Fourier transform also if if you don't have a PSD function, but then the yeah it it will then reflect in in the spectral density itself. Cool. Thank you. Okay. 
let's let's go forward. Okay, so here I have visualized a bunch of uh, spectral densities of some uh, kernel uh, types. So here's three kernel types. Here the Gaussian kernel, exponential kernel, and triangular kernel. And all of these have known and closed form spectral densities. And these have been now visualized here. So sure, this, this is theoretically quite interesting, but it doesn't really give us mechanism to build new kernels. So we are really interested in given a custom spectral density, can we construct a new kernel? So let, let's start looking at that, that stuff. So here is the, the perhaps the simplest spectral kernel out there, which is also, to my knowledge, this is the first spectral kernel introduced in the literature. So from 2010, we have the sparse spectrum kernel, the SS kernel, where we simply define that we have Q, we have a mixture of Q frequencies that we learn as, as coefficients or parameters that we optimize, and they uh, form Dirac, uh, mixture of Dirac uh, density on, on the spectral density. And Dirac's are, of course, infinite spikes. Here I have visualized them as just sort of so that they would normalize to one, uh, slightly abusing the, the Dirac, Dirac formalism. So now, now if we have this kind of spectral density here, we can apply the inverse Fourier transform, and it gives us a corresponding set of cosines. And this seems very nice. So it's just like, it seems very simple. We just, in this example, we just have five frequencies we need to optimize, and then we would just get five uh, cosines that we are summing together to get the kernel function. Uh, the problem is that this is very rigid. This, this, this only considers these five cosines. It doesn't really give any flexibility or any sort of like slack in, in the kernel itself. Things are noisy and things are messy in real life. So this is, not very useful for general machine learning problems, but then for some kind, some sort of noise-free signal processing task, this might be very appropriate. So to fix sort of this kind of rigidness of the sparse spectrum kernel, then the spectral mixture kernel uh, instead defines the, the spectral uh, density as a mixture of Gaussians, where we have some variance around uh, the mean frequencies or even where we can just define arbitrary densities using a mixture of Gaussians and then map them back to, to, Gaussian, uh, to, to kernels. So here we would define that, okay, the spectral density is a mixture of Gaussians. Each Gaussian has a frequency mean, it has a frequency variance, and then it has some kind of weighting or amplitude term. The inverse Fourier transform then becomes this integral and it has a cost form solution where we have two terms emerging. We have a Gaussian looking term here, where the sigma now becomes the inverse length scale, or represent the inverse length scale. And we also have this pi sort of weighting things as well. And then we have the cosine term, which then considers the, the frequency mean. And, and this kernel is now dense in the set of stationary kernels, which means that this kernel can generate any stationary kernel. And this is a really amazing property. So this kernel can really represent any stationary kernels and the space of stationary kernels is really large. So one could actually sort of in principle replace modern kernel and Gaussian kernel and whatnot kernels with, with just this one family uh, if we would have efficient inference for this thing. And I will, I will talk about that in, in a few moments. Okay, and as a small test, we can actually again see empirically, does this work? So we can take a standard Gaussian kernel as our target, which would be visualized here on black. So the Gaussian kernel on the, on the left as black, and then the Gaussian kernel spectral density on the right again as black. And then can we now with five components, can we sort of reproduce the Gaussian kernel? And it seems that we can just by placing these five, five components here on spectral density, it forms this red line, which then approximately forms the Gaussian kernel on the left. And actually we can of course do this with just one component because obviously we just have one component that follows exactly the black, black spectral density of the Gaussian kernel. So for example, we could initialize the spectral mixture kernel with the Gaussian kernel and then let it evolve and then be something, something more if the data supports that. Okay, any, any questions about this stuff? Uh, none at the moment by the looks of it. Um, I'll let you know if anyone asks. Okay, very good. 
Okay, and then here is a visualization of, of sort of the main things we have been looking at. We have a Gaussian kernel, which just looks at the neighborhoods. We have SS kernel, and then we have SM kernel that, that can also look at long range correlations. Cool, uh, one's popped up um, from Chen Kung. How, to, how would you do this approximation in practice? Maybe that's what you're about to get onto. Um, but... uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think that, so this is just an example showing that there is some empirical correspondence between a Gaussian kernel and the SM kernel. I think in practice, you could initialize the SM kernel components in a way that it reproduces sort of like at, at initialization, it reproduces Gaussian kernel. And then because it has optimizable parameters, it could then evolve and change its kernel shape. That, that is something that I think could be also in practice useful. Okay. Oh, thank you. And next I'm going to then show the, so the optimization part. Okay, so we still have one more question. Uh, evidently we require an infinite sum to include the RBF in this family of operation care. Would it be more precise to say this is the family of modern kernels of the specific order? Um, so modern kernel is usually described in terms of, of the differentiability. And then here in this SM kernel, we really are looking at the mixture of Gaussians, which is infinitely differentiable. So I, I think the SM kernel doesn't directly link with modern, but I mean, obviously modern also does have Fourier transforms like, like at, as, as, much, as much as it does. Yeah, but this is an interesting question. So hmm, not, not sure about this. Okay, so let, let's go. Let's go back to the story. Okay, so here we have the the, the inference part of SM kernel. So SM kernel now just has this mixture form, where we now have three parameters to optimize instead of just one. So usually you just oh wow, the thing turned blue for some reason. Is it also blue for everyone else? Yeah, I don't know why. Um, so I, I was sort of saying things, but now. It might be because somehow you've selected everything. Is that possible Maybe or something? I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so okay, now it's good again. Let's go back. That's very strange. That's strange. Wow, well, I've never seen that. Okay, so yeah, so we have a uh, we have now uh, three parameters to optimize. Previously, we usually just had length scale and, and signal variance. Now we have signal variance, uh, inverse length scale, and then these frequency means. So we actually only have one more term to optimize. We again optimize them using much of likelihood. And then for example, here we would have a data and we would again optimize much of likelihood and find, find the kernel form. And here on the right, we see the learned uh, spectral density uh, given this data, which is now represented as blue. So we would learn in this case, there's actually seven components. So each of these black peaks represents one Dirac component or goes yeah, with very small variance. And then we also have this guy at one over three we have this guy at one, and then we have this one big component at zero or a bit off from zero. So what this now represents is that, okay, it has learned that there, there are frequencies of one over three uh, here, one over four, one over six, and then a frequency of one, and then interestingly, even a frequency of higher than one, which represents some kind of noise process. So a frequency of one over six would mean a period of six. That would mean a period of six months. So it has found out that, okay, in this data, something repeats at six month interval, or there is sort of six month correlations. And it has also found that there are three month uh, correlations and, and four month correlations. And this is sort of the ingredients it has been able to build from to make this 12 month uh, periodicity pattern in this case. Cool. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Um, are you okay to take them now? Or? Yeah, sure. Uh, cool, so Simon asks, does the frequency depend implicitly on the density of the observations? Uh, yes, in, in the sense that the, the sampling rate is often defined as sort of the shortest distance between any two observations, like how, how densely the observations are packed. And of course, you cannot learn like anything that is sort of between two data points. So there's like a limit of how, how big or small frequencies you can learn. Cool. And there's another question in the chat. Sorry, there's sort of actually maybe if everyone 
in, in the Q&A button, then we won't miss any. Uh, Mohit says, we are told today that, um, uh, what does he write? Uh, yeah, I, I can see it. So we are told that the mother and kernel are four returns of one over Return. something. Is there any significance is public a function in Fourier domain? Uh, not sure, not sure. Okay, and then one more question. Um, looks like the SM kernel is appropriate to interplay data test trend and periodic, periodically. Yes, so that's a good question. And, and sort of the classic use case of, of SM kernel is exactly this kind of periodic pattern extrapolation or repeating a periodic, uh, a periodic uh, pattern. I, I'm going to show you two more applications in the next slides. So, so things are, are coming, but in principle, this could, be applied to just general machine learning, but in that sort of like just if you just have a data that just we assume okay the inputs are like you you uh, coming from from unit ball normalized and then just some surface on top of that. In that case, the SM kernel would learn some kind of Gaussian style thing, but it could also learn sort of extra uh, structure in the kernel. Okay, then another question: Do you see any connection to this? To a spectral expansion in orthogonal polynomials, a polynomial case expansion. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with this stuff. Uh, and then, is it suitable to use SM kernel when we have few data points? Uh, yes, that, that is definitely uh, one of the one of the sort of bottlenecks of SM kernel is that if you only have little data, then it becomes very easy to fit it perfectly by just like memorizing a bunch of frequencies that match the small set, set of data perfectly. And then overfitting can happen. In that case, you need to place hyper priors on the frequencies. For example, you could place a prior on the mu so that you cannot uh, fit the training data perfectly anymore. Can I ask, uh, there's one more question in the chat, and then maybe we should keep going. Um, from Dr. Vatsala, if the data is not periodic, does the SM kernel find, um, find application? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it does. I think it does because it, it allows you, for example, to say, change the shape of the of the, so for example, the initialized Gaussian kernel. And, 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 and it, it, it can sort of give you like find surprising structure in the data. That's something like a Gaussian kernel cannot find because Gaussian kernel simply interpolates in a sort of like local manner. And, and that's it. That's the only thing it can do. So you don't really know if there is some hidden structure there if you just use that. Okay, I think those are the main, main questions now. So let's, let's move forward. So I'm, I still have a few slides on the SM kernel and then we will move into even more complex kernels. Okay. So here, uh, one use case for, for SM kernel is, is images where you could uh, in paint or fill portions of the images that are not known. For example, in this upper figure, you could say that, okay, you could learn the pattern from the outside pixels, and then you could regress or predict the missing inside pixels. And since you learn from the outside pixels, which have a very regular pattern, you would learn the frequencies in the color space of this repeating pattern. And then you could fill in this, this like wallpaper style thing. Another thing you could do is that you could take this uh, landscape figure here, you would learn only from the C portion of this image using that only as training data and then learn to extrapolate, for example, these roofs using the C model. So it would then predict more of the C there. Uh, this is actually a really cool example because it shows sort of the limitation of this model, which is that it, it doesn't understand what is C and what is land because it learns just the fixed spectral density. It learns the same frequency, same patterns in a location independent manner. So you have same frequencies, no matter which pixel you are looking at. While here, clearly you should have different frequencies for the C, port, C pixels and different frequencies for the roof pixels and so on. And that is something that we are, we are going to discuss shortly a bit more. Okay, and then final example of, of the SM kernel applications is, is spatiotemporal modeling, which is one of the clear sort of st strong points for this model. Uh, here we can assume we have temperature data from North America, uh, where we have different locations with temperatures, and then we have this data over time. 
uh, this is now effectively three-dimensional data. We have x, y, and time. So longitude, latitude, and time. Uh, and then we could now look at what kind of correlation do we learn with Gaussian kernel? What kind of correlation do we learn with the spectral mixture kernel, which is much more flexible? And we can see that with the Gaussian kernel, we learned that, okay, you can kind of interpolate like 20 kilometers to east and west. You can interpolate maybe 40 kilometers north, south, and you can interpolate maybe four months when you are interpolating uh, temperature. But the spectral mixture kernel can, can unravel that, hey, actually, uh, especially on the time axis, if you think like how does now the temperature of my location correlate with temperature of my location in six months? Well, it doesn't correlate because if now is uh, summer, then in six months it's going to be winter and you have no correlation. But if you look at current location in now and current location in 12 months, you are comparing summer to summer and these definitely should correlate. So that's why we have this nice repeating pattern here in, in the SM case. Uh, now, one problem here is that uh, SM only learns stationary covariances, but here temperature data could represent a non-stationary process. For example, maybe one year the temperatures are evolving very smoothly and very, very sort of regularly. Maybe one year the temperatures are throwing up and down very rapidly. So clearly we would need different kinds of processes in different years. It in Gaussian processes it would translate to having different kernels in different years, or maybe having different kernel parameters in different years or different locations. And that is exactly what non-stationary models would do. And that's what we are going to look at, look at next. Okay, so there's no, no questions, so I'm, I'm just going to move forward. So uh, let's look at what stationary kernel means. So stationary kernels are translation invariant. That means that the stationary kernel is something where you can add a constant to both inputs and nothing happens. This also means that the stationary kernel between two inputs is a function of their distance. So if, if we take a bit of artificial example and look at like human age as a covariate, then a stationary kernel would say that the similarity between one and two year old is the same as the similarity between 80 and 81 year old. But one could say, does this make sense? Why would you say this? Clearly the differences are different and not the same. An non-stationary kernel wouldn't make this consumption and it would not be a translation invariant. It could give different similarities to two inputs which are sort of scaled to, like we still have the same distance, but they're in a different location in the, in the data space. Uh, the simplest non-stationary kernel is the dot product kernel, but yeah, that's not very, very useful or very common in practice. Okay, we have a question. Are there some transformation algorithms that turn non-stationary kernels into stationary one? Uh, um, yes, th there are family of methods called warping methods, where you can apply, for example, link functions like a logistic transformation and those kind of things. And those could then translate a non-stationary uh, signal into a stationary signal. For example, if, if you think like a logarithmic, uh, logarithmic function, then after suitable transformations, it could become much more regular. But I, I'm not sure if there is sort of any any sort of guaranteed transformations that always work. I think most of them are sort of case specific. But yeah, good question. Okay. So let, let's take a let's take an example where we have a stationarity problem, so to speak. Uh, here is a simple data, super simple, uh, one dimensional data. Let's regress, like let's interpolate some data. In the data, we have like some stuff going on. We have like a gap in the beginning. And in the end, it seems to be have a quite a high noise level. But otherwise, not, nothing fanciful. So surely a Gaussian process should be able to fit this. Okay, so this is the best uh, optimal Gaussian process under a Gaussian kernel with optimized length scale, signal variance, and noise variance. And it's not a very good fit. Uh, at the end, we see that it overfits, or well, not really even overfits, it just has a, like a some strange stuff going on. It kind of is not smooth enough in the end. In the beginning, at this gap, it is doing something strange. It kind of has this positive bias and it has a huge variance. In the middle, it's doing a good job. Okay, we could try to fix this by, hey, let's increase the length scale. Now we get much better fits in the beginning and in the end, but the middle stuff 
is not fitting anymore at all because the length scale is just too high now to be able to fit these fast changes. And then because we increase the length scale, we now need to increase the noise level to be able to fit the data. And, and it just seems that there's, there's nothing we can do. Like we really need input dependent parameters. Like we need a parameter where the length scale can be small in the big middle and large in, in the ends. Okay, so sounds great. Let, let's do this. But I mean, how, how do we even do this? Like how do we place a different length scales for different data points? Like we, how do we even inject it into the kernel? Well, the solution is that we need a new kernel. So here we have just the regular Gaussian kernel in the first bullet and the so-called non-stationary Gaussian kernel, which is uh, introduced by, by Gibbs in 1997 uh, for, for Gaussian processes, uh, has a form where instead of having a fixed length scale coefficient, we have a length scale function over data and where in the exponent, we take a sum of two length scale uh, squares for the both inputs. And then we have some normalizing term, which is not particularly interesting. And this also has a multivariate form. Okay, so now we have a kernel where we can actually input length scales that vary over, over input. So now let's then do this stuff. So on the left, we see sort of the ideal fit from this kind of model. So we see now the fit is beautiful. Like it's just fantastic. The gap is taken into account really beautifully. We have at the end, we have this increasing noise variance here and it's very smooth, looks really nice. And what has happened is that it has learned that the length scale is now a function over time, or in this case, the input, as well as the signal variance and noise variance being over time. On the right, we see the model definition. This is actually a pretty nice sort of example of how you could define a hierarchical Gaussian process model. So you would assume by, you would start by assuming that, okay, the offset data Y is a function F plus epsilon, Epsilon represents the noise process or the observation noise process where omega is now the noise variance, uh, where this now depends, is, is, a, is an input dependent as well. F is a Gaussian process that can now input, that can now take in a kernel which has a length scale function and also the signal variance is now a function. Uh, we also assume that all of these three parameter processes are Gaussian processes as well, so that they are smooth. And we have the kernel that we have just shown. And this then, if we now infer this using much and likelihood, we can actually find the map solution on the left. Now, if we go forward, we will also do MCMC inference here. So by applying Hamilton and Monte Carlo, which is a very efficient way of doing MCMC, we could actually infer, we could actually sample all possible combinations of link scale signal variance and noise variance functions that match the data, which would also give some kind of more like ensemble style also fit for the main function. Well, there's a question in the chat. Um, yes, I, I know this. So Florian asks, how can we use this for unknown data HRA and sequential doing tender fit periodically online? Uh, I'm actually not sure which does this refer now to this. I guess this now refers to this non-stationary Gaussian kernel, but but yes, yeah, so so the main problem is how, how do we then sort of extrapolate? So how but I mean, because this is a Gaussian process model, you do get some estimates on sort of outside these bounds. So after one and before zero. And especially in this case, you would get distribution. So, so naturally you would expect that, for example, for negative values here on the left side, you would get a, a big spread of values of like length scales going up and down and all kinds of possibilities, which would basically mean that outside the data, we kind of reduce back to prior which is exactly what needs to happen in Gaussian processes. So if we go super far away from data, we should just have sample from the prior again. Okay, I hope the best answers your question. Yeah, maybe the question is also, it looks like about what you do about if more data arrives, um, if so, I mean, how do you update the model? I think that maybe is the gist of the question. Yeah, so, so yeah, you would then refit. And then this of course has some issues that uh, generally sort of sequential modeling of GPs is not very well studied. So there are a few papers on this, but generally the problem is that when new data comes from and you refit your, let's say, maximum likelihood, what happens to your earlier fits? Are they now changing? They might be changing. And maybe you want this, maybe you don't want this. So you would really need some kind of sequential fitting process, some kind of online Gaussian process. There's a few papers on this, but definitely 
it's it's definitely not not a solved problem yet. Cool. And there's one quick question in the Q and in the Q and A section. Yeah. So Oriol asks. So since you mentioned Bogner's theorem, generalizing to n one dimension, is it possible to not say on a two D four domain? Yes, it is. So so I, I'm going to talk about the, the non-stationary spectral kernels next. But yeah, it, it definitely does. Okay, so now, now we got, got a nice, pretty good model. So we have a model for, for like just Gaussian process with a Gaussian kernel that can handle non-stationary uh, behavior. So we can have a length scale that evolves over, over the space of inputs. Now, can we do the same for spectral kernels? Can we look at changing frequencies? And this is something that, yes, it is possible. So this is something we introduced in ALTA in 2017. So we denote this as generalized spectral mixture kernel, where we modify the spectral mixture kernel by saying that the, the cosine term, the frequency means are now dependent on the, fun, on, on the data point. And we also change the exponential term, the standard Gaussian term into this non-stationary Gaussian term. And we also make this you know, variance to be uh, input dependent and with suitable Gaussian process priors on these parameter process functions, we can now learn spectral kernels, for example, in a case where the frequencies are changing over input X, for example, time. So in this very artificial example, uh, the frequency is, is nicely increasing towards the left. So this can then model that, okay, for different time points, you have different frequencies. So you can then study the, the spectrogram. So here the spectrogram is now in a very informal way, it's just, just a visualization of what frequencies do we have for which data points. And here we can see that we have the highest frequencies for the small inputs and then frequency decreasing when we go to right. And then we get these kind of kernel, kernel matrices when we evaluate this kernel here, which looks a bit sort of, I don't know, strange looking, but here, the main thing is probably that if, if you look at sort of the first row, it, it shows very periodic kernel structure. And then at the bottom, it shows something that is very Gaussian-like. So it can kind of identify that, OK, at the end, close to one, there is little periodicity left anymore. It has kind of reverted to Gaussian. OK. Uh, I'm also shortly going to mention, this is something I'm not, not going to cover too much. But we also have a more recent work where we kind of have a unified theory on non-stationary spectral kernels. And this is from last year. And this is coming from the intuition that the Gaussian process actually can be uh, characterized as a convolution over white noise. So if, if we define that f of x is a convolution of a white noise process, which actually is a Gaussian process with delta or Dirac kernel, with some feature map k, this now kind of becomes like a colored Gaussian process, so it's not Dirac kernel anymore. And then just by definition, you also can solve the kernel function of such convolution processes, which then becomes a convolution over a product between two feature maps. And then we have a complex conjugate here just to make sure that the, the math works out. And visually, this, this then means that uh, we are kind of convolving or moving this kind of noise pattern, which is the red curve, just white noise pattern. We are moving it to the right on this uh, feature map surface. And then this gives us one function sample here. And it also can give us the convolution, this, this, the, kernel, uh, the kernel function as well. And this is now just a, this is just a general approach on how we can define a Gaussian process and how we can define a Gaussian process kernel from convolution theory. And the key thing is now that if, now the only thing we can change is the feature map K. So now if we choose this suitably, we actually can recover many different kernels that we've been actually looking at today. So if we choose a regular Gaussian uh, base, sort of RBF basis on top of each data point with a fixed uh, covariance, we get a Gaussian kernel back. If we choose a uh, Gaussian RBF function where the covariance depends over, over a data point, we get a non-stationary Gaussian kernel. Spectral kernel is one where we have added to the, to the data point mean of this 
basis RBF, an imaginary component, which then translates into a bunch of cosines. And a non-stationary case is one where the, the, uh, the frequency mean depends on, on the data as well. So here the mu represents the frequencies and, and sigma represents the, the, the Gaussian covariance. And then now we could then solve these using this C notation, we could solve the kernel form, and then we'll get basically what, what we already showed, showed to you today. So this, this is a pretty nice, and, and you can read more from this paper, and we, we have the quite a lot of theory there. Okay, so I'm going to show you one example of, of what this does in, in sort of temporal interpolation task. So here, if we have, for example, this, I think this is like solar activity data, how, how active is the sun? Uh, the blue is the training data, red is the missing test data. This kind of kernel can now learn, okay, what frequencies do we have? What variances do we have? What length scales do we have at different uh, times? So it seems to be it seems to be working pretty well, and, and, and it seems to have also some kind of interpretability uh, that somehow gives us a bit more than just the regression and saying that the length scale was x. Okay, so we have Barbara asking: Is there a Python library available that implements cyclic kernels, and is there a rule of thumb to define the number of series q you are adding? Um, so yeah, so we have uh, some GitHub codes, but it's not not very polished code. So you can try. So at, at least all, all the ex experiments we did in the paper are, can be reproduced from there. And then on terms of the queue selection, the, the bigger the queue, then of course the more expressive kernel, the more complex things you can model. And in practice, this would be something where you try a bunch of different queues and try to see whether it starts to sort of saturate in terms of much much more likelihood. Trying to see that okay, when does adding more queue not help anymore. Okay, and then just final sort of proper slides before conclusion, or I think I still have two slides. Now we can look at what actually happens if we do spatiotemporal uh, interpol interpolation with non-stationary spectral kernel. So here we again have this kind of global temperature uh, data where we have now on the left one snapshot of the data. So here is temperature on May 91, uh, where we have like, there is lots of hotness in North America. There's some cool breeze in Europe. And again, North, North Russia is, is very hot. Now, if you look at top right, the squared exponential kernel simply uh, interpolates or, or represents the, the kernel so that if you, if you look at sort of what is similar to London, sort of spatially. Of course, in a Gaussian kernel, you would say that things that are close to London are similar to London. So you say that, okay, maybe France is close to London, but Africa is not. But in, in non-stationary spectral kernels, and even in spectral kernels, you can say that actually things that, are, things that are similar to London don't need to be geographically close to London. So you could have that actually like South Pacific is suddenly similar to London, but not Africa for some reason. So you can learn these extremely long range connections, correlations in the kernel structure, which then uh, they are learned from the data. So there definitely is something there. The problem is that out of all possible correlation structures you could learn, how do you know that this one shown here is good? Well, we don't really know. I mean, you can look at the prediction accuracies. This gives good prediction accuracies. So in that sense, sure, this is justified because it works in practice. But could there have been a simpler uh, frequency pattern or simpler correlation structure to be found? And I believe this is maybe still an open problem of how do we regularize these spectral models efficiently? How do we do model selection with these things? This is something that hasn't been discussed too much in the literature. So there are sort of two flexible models. Okay, and we have some questions still. So what are the downsides or issues of the kernel versus spectral kernel? Yes, the, the downside is actually this. So we have extreme flexibility. They can learn pretty much anything and, and it's easy to overfit them. So then it, you need to really carefully regularize uh, or do HMC sampling and not, not be satisfied with the MAP, MAP solutions. Okay. And then sort of that's, that's kind of uh, summarized here. So 
if we now relook at the marginal log likelihood. What does it really mean? So in the marginal log likelihood, we are really looking at the expectation of one density under the other density, or one random variable under the other random variable. So now if, if you can modify your prior PF to perfectly match PYF, you maximize the marginal log likelihood, but you only then limit your prior to contain functions that exactly match training data. And this could be extremely dangerous. So model selection is, is really the key with more flexible kernels. For example, here in the chirp signal, you only learn functions that have a certain frequency setting scales. How do you know that outside the training range, it still follows the, exactly this, this sort of behavior? You don't really know. Okay, we have a question. Is it usually usual to bound the parameters of spectral functions? Um, ye yes, or, or usually you add some kind of link function which sort of squashes them to reasonable ranges. For example, often you want to limit negative, like you don't want negative frequencies, so you can apply a log it or log transform and so on and so on. Okay, I think that was my, my presentation and I still have a few minutes left. So. Uh, as, as a summary, I think we have today looked at uh, various spectral kernels and we have looked what they can do in addition, sort of what they can do that standard, uh, for example, Gaussian kernel cannot do. And the key thing is that they can repeat, they can extrapolate some kind of repeating pattern. And the non stationary kernels can even uh, extrapolate sort of evolving patterns over the input, input space. And, and this is, of course, very, very lucrative and powerful, but that, that it uh, does come at the cost of, of more possibilities to overfit. And, and in practice, these are also quite slow to, slow to fit. And you often get like some kind of really poor optima that you get stuck in. You have to repeat these experiments many times and so on and so on. So there are practical issues here for sure. OK, so, so thanks for your attention. Uh, it seems that we still have a few questions. Yeah, if you've got time for a couple of questions and then uh, we can wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have a question from David. You mentioned that moral selection is the key. Could you please point out the good approach to apply moral selection? Uh, so I think in moral selection, one is that you, you should probably not be using map inference or rely too much on that. So map inference means that you just try to find the optimal, let's, let, let's say, length scales or frequencies. Instead, you should probably apply MCMC sampling, where you're trying to infer the posterior of frequencies and length scales, for example. But in, in general, this is, this is a very, very challenging aspect of, of, of Bayesian machine learning. OK, any, any more questions? Sort of, it would be not nice to hear any, any questions about any, any parts of the talk. Well, there's one question appeared. Maybe that's the last question. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So there's a few questions. So uh, can you explain the sources of slowness? So the sources of slowness is that uh, all machine learning models have a loss landscape. So you define loss, and then you minimize some loss. Now in like neural networks, this is very simple. You just minimize your weights. In Gaussian processes, you have a bunch of hyperparameters or length scales or whatnot, and your loss becomes your posterior uh, approximation. Uh, the problem is that if your loss is very multimodal or very peaky, you have lots of peaks and valleys, you often get stuck into suboptimal solutions. And with uh, spectral kernels, there's so many excellent solutions and so many bad solutions in, 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 the, in, the, in the model space that sort of just exploring this space will become difficult. And then you cannot simply rely on just running like Adam once and hoping that you'll get a good solution you really need to run it many, many times. You need to think in terms of initializations, which are good initializations and, and so on. So it, it really is this kind of practical, very numeric issues that you, you encounter. Cool. Um, maybe I don't know where you want to stop. We sort of come at the end of time. Do you want to pick one of the questions to answer? And then, and then we can maybe call it a day. <laughs> Yeah, sure. It, it's fine for me. It depends on what, how, how do you want to organize this. I, okay, I can run for another couple of minutes if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we have Christian from Felix. So hi, many thanks for the work. Any chance of extensions to quasi-stationary data? For instance, better data have noise corrupted inputs are difficult to fit in better kernels. 
Mm, yeah, that's a really, really cool, cool stuff. And that's, that's something I'm personally very interested in. Uh, so I guess if I understand correctly, that would be that your inputs are corrupted. So this would be like an image whose pixels are corrupted, but the label is not, or there is like just the usual label uncertainty. Yeah, th this is a really cool approach. And, and this is something we have done some research on doing sort of input warping approach, trying to sort of first clean the data with one model and then apply it to a more traditional Gaussian process model. I think that might be a good, good approach there. But yeah, I, I think in terms of uh, spe spectral kernels, the problem becomes that if, if you assume uncertainty in the inputs as well, that uh, I would assume the integrals become really, really hairy because like there's no, no guarantee of anything anymore. If you, if you don't even know what, where are you in the data space. Okay, and then maybe final question uh, from Anonymous. Isn't the generalization problem inherent to any model if the data generated is not representative enough for the true process and hence you will never model the true? Yeah, exactly. So this is the, this is the problem of machine learning. What is the underlying model? Can you learn it? Can you trust that you have learned it? And, and if, you, if you don't know whether you have learned the underlying process, then maybe it's just better to use a simpler model that it's not so fancy, but at least it doesn't air as bad in the worst case. Cool. Thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, taking part and help and all the interesting questions and things as well. Um, right. I think, yeah, it's time to wrap up. Yeah, that was a really interesting talk. I, I learned so much each year at GPSS, even though I've been coming for so many years. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the lectures. Um, I guess uh, we'll see you all again tomorrow for lectures. The topics for tomorrow are scalable Gaussian processes, uh, non-Gaussian likelihoods, and um, multiple output GPs. Um, Marcus, do you have anything to add? Or is that... No, nothing particular. No, cool. Thanks again, Marcus, for uh, the really interesting talk. Um, yeah, see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Yeah, okay, really nice. So it was really nice talking and it's surprising a lot of, a lot of people here. Yeah, thank you, it's been great.